Unmuted. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this web seminar. Today's topic is about pressure meters and other in-situ soil testing equipment. But first, some technical information. You should hear my voice through your PC speaker or headset. You can ask questions using the questions panel on the right of your screen. We will answer in the questions panel at the end of the presentation and if necessary later by email. Later this week you will receive link to the presentation and to data sheets. This presentation is essentially about pressure meters. I may mention the here is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. I may mention here that Rocktest has developed a good expertise in this type of equipment by developing, manufacturing and selling pressure meters over 40 years now. Actually, rock test played a significant role in the introduction of this type of test in North America. So, during this presentation, I will describe this type of test as well as different types of pressure meters available. I will talk about the main applications for the pressure meter. And finally, I will present the main advantages and limitations about this test. During the last part of my presentation, I will briefly present some well-known other testing equipment like the cone and shear vein tester. Proper characterization of mechanical properties of the ground onto which structures are to be built is of course very important. Lack of knowledge of these can have catastrophic effects. A very old example of that is the Bent Pyramid in Egypt, which is among the first ever built large pyramids. Due to serious problems during construction, coming from large soil movements, it was decided to reduce the slope of the pyramid faces in order to reduce overall weight of the structure. Such problem could have been prevented with better information about the ground properties. I don't know which ground testing, if any, were performed at that time, but obviously they were not adequate. Over the years, many testing methods have been developed. These tests can be done on samples, which are the laboratory tests, or on sites, which are called the in-situ tests. In-situ testing methods can be divided in three types those which consist in measuring the resistance to penetration, like the SPT or CPT tests, those which consist in measuring permeability of the ground, like the Packer tests, and finally those which consist in measuring strength and compressibility response of the ground when loaded. Examples of this type of test include plate load testing, vein shear test, and flat dilatometer. The pressure meter is included in this last category. The pressure meter test consists in loading the ground by means of a cylindrical probe and by measuring the ground response to this loading. The stresses are applied on the ground with pressurized fluid, typically nitrogen or water. This fluid is acting via an inflatable membrane which is covering the pressure meter probe. On this slide, you can see a pressure meter. The picture at the left shows a control panel with various valves, dial gauges, and pressure regulator, which allows the operator to control and to read pressures and radial expansion of the probe during a test. You can also see the compressed gas cylinder for applying pressure and the probe to be inserted into the ground. You can finally see the tubing connecting the control panel and the probe. 
So, after calibration of the probe, the probe is lowered down in the borehole to the test depth, and finally the test is run as shown on the right side picture. The calibration of the probe consists in inflating the unconfined probe and measure the resistance of the membrane. This resistance will then be subtracted from the test results for getting the true applied pressure on the ground. A second calibration will be necessary for the pressure meters based on volumetric measurement principle. The purpose of this calibration is to determine the volume losses due to the expansion of the tubing and to the compressibility of any part of the equipment, including the probe and the liquid. This calibration is done by pressurizing the probe in a steel tube. The volume loss will be deducted from the measured volume during a test. It must be noted that typically the probe will be lowered down in a borehole made previously. We are talking about pre-boring pressure meters. But in some cases, the probe will be pushed or driven in place. Some other pressure meters are self-boring. In that case, the probe is equipped with a cutting tool for drilling the borehole. During this presentation, unless specifically mentioned, we are talking about the pre-boring pressure meter. A typical loading sequence looks like this. On this graph, pressure readings is on the x-axis, and volumetric expansion, or the radial expansion, is on the y-axis. The first portion of the curve on the left side corresponds to the moment when the inflatable membrane of the probe makes contact with the borehole walls. During the second phase, contact between the membrane and the ground is well established, and we have what is called a pseudo-elastic phase, which is characterized by being quite linear. And finally, over a certain pressure, PF, the ground starts to yield and enters into a plastic phase. The sequence of loading may vary depending on the type of pressure meter, the type of ground, and depending which standard is followed. Unload reload cycles can be done. Typically, a test will last about 10 minutes until reaching failure of the soil, and during which it is important to collect enough readings allowing to plot this curve with enough accuracy. At the bottom left, you can see reference numbers of standards about pressure meters. Pressure meter tests are normally carried out at different depths in the same borehole. The results are integrated to give a profile of the pressure meter parameters of the soil. Common spacings between tests vary from 1 to 3 meters. The borehole should not be made in a single pass, but in steps. These steps consist in 1. Drilling the borehole to the first testing depth. 2. Removing the drilling equipment from the borehole. 3. Lowering the pressure meter probe to the testing depth. 4. Running the test and five, removing the probe. This process must be repeated for each test. Following this procedure, about eight tests in the same hole per day can be done. The main parameters obtained from that test are the pressure meter modulus, E, and the limit pressure, PL. The pressure meter modulus is a deformation modulus directly related to the slope of the pseudo-elastic zone of the pressure meter curve, delta PB over delta V. It is also function to the Poisson's ratio, VR, and to the volume of the test cavity, VM. 
The pressure meter modulus is directly used for calculating the settlement predictions. The limit pressure is the pressure at which the soil is considering having completely failed. It is defined particularly to be the pressure required to double the initial volume of the test cavity. Since this level cannot be reached during a test without bursting the probe membrane, the limit pressure is estimated by extrapolating this curve. This parameter is applied to the bearing capacity calculations. Other parameters like the coefficient of earth pressure at rest, the k naught, can be obtained in some cases from the pressure meter test. This value is deducted from the initial portion of the curve at the left. The making of the borehole is very important to make successful pressure meter tests. First, the borehole must not be disturbed. If we disturb too much the soil while making the borehole, we will not obtain a pressure meter curve with the proper shape and we won't get a representative modulus value. Remolding of the soil will be prevented by following proper drilling methods. For instance, you should not drive a split spoon close to the testing zone. 2. The diameter of the borehole should, not, should be adequate. The borehole should not be smaller than the probe. Otherwise, you would need to push the probe in place, which would remold the soil. On the other hand, the borehole should not be too large, no more than about 1.1 times the diameter of the probe. Otherwise, it will not be possible to complete the test without bursting the membrane. And three, the borehole walls should be smooth and uniform. If there are cavities at some places, the membrane will bulge in and burst. The use of thick bentonite mud can prevent some gravels from falling down, preventing the creation of cavities. Different drilling methods are suggested in the standards, depending on the type of soil. From our experience, we suggest to use rotary drilling method with axial injection towards hole bottom. And we suggest the use of bentonite mud. If you know this method, you will be able to work in most types of soil. Only in cases where there are a lot of large gravels, the use of a slotted casing can be required. The slotted ca casing consists of a steel casing with slots, which can easily expand and in which the pressure meter probe is installed. This casing can bridge the voids on the borehole walls, preventing the probe membrane to burst. But the use of a slotted casing will be limited to extreme situations, considering that its use is not easy. When using the rotary drilling method, we suggest using roller bits between 2 and 7 eighths to 3 inches. Keeping different bit sizes on site will allow making adjustments if necessary. Three wing bit can be used for clay soils. It is very important to allow an easy flow upward of the mud for proper evacuation of cuttings. That, that is why diameter of drilling rods should not be too large. For instance, if you drill an N size hole, we suggest to use AW rods. Every precautions must be taken for not getting an oversized hole. For instance, the driller should not ram the bit up and down the borehole. A popular method consists in using a 3-inch hollow auger for the first portion of the borehole and then to use a rotary drilling bit for the testing zone only. It is important not to hurry while dr drilling the testing cavity. 
The numbers at the bottom of this slide reflect that. For instance, the drilling RPM should not exceed 60. The flow, the injection, and the bit, pre and the bit pressures must be kept low. In section 1.2, I will talk about the equipment and more specifically about the different types of pressure meters available. Knowing a bit more about the different types of pressure meters can be helpful for selecting a pressure meter and for better understanding the slight differences regarding how they are ran and regarding the results they generate. First, you have the pre-boring pressure meters and the self-boring ones. As mentioned before, in this presentation we focus on the pre-boring pressure meters since, since these are most commonly used and since self-boring pressure meters are, in a way, in their own category regarding how they are run and how results from these pressure meters can be interpreted. You have also pressure meters that measure volume variations of the probe from which we should deduct the radial strain and those that measures directly the radial strain. The first category is more common probably because it is easy to run and to maintain and because of its sturdiness. The second category of probe is fitted with displacement transducers. It can measure anisotropy of soils. Some probes are fitted with two expandable membranes. These are the Menard pressure meters and are referred to as tricellular probes. These pressure meters are, use, are using two circuits, one for, one for a gas and one for a water circuit. This is for preventing the end effects or bias due to variations of the shape of the membrane during the test. The other type of probe is equipped with a single membrane and is referred to as a monocellular probe. The diameter of the probe can also vary a lot depending on the model of pressure meters. From 33 millimeter for, uh, for pavement mini pressure meters to 95 millimeters for pressure meters designed for rock. The standard size in Europe is 60 millimeters, whereas the 74 millimeter probe is more common in North America. The type of loading can either be pneumatic or hydraulic. The reading mode can be manual or automatic depending on the equipment. And finally, the, work, the working capacity and sensitivity can also vary. These will increase with pressure meters designed for use in stiff soils or in soft rock. The capacity of soil pressure meter is normally around 10,000 kPa. Here are three examples of pressure meters. At the left, you have a Minard pressure meter, which is based on the volumetric measurement principle. This pressure meter is pneumatically loaded and is fitted with a tree cellular probe. Then you have the Texan pressure meter. This pressure meter is based on the volumetric measurement principle, is hydraulically loaded and is fitted with a monocellular probe. And at the right you have the, tri the model Trimodes pressure meter. This model is uh, based on the radial expansion measurement. It is hydraulically loaded and is, it is fitted with a monocellular probe. On this slide, you can see a, a special pressure meter designed for use in rock, the model Probex. The Probex has a capacity of 30,000 kPa. It is hydraulically loaded and it is fitted with a probe 
equipped with a fiberglass reinforced polyurethane membrane. This very tough membrane allowed the use of the probex in, in the rock. The maximum modulus that can be obtained with this uh, pressure meter is 30 gigapascal, which allow its use in moderately rock, uh, hard rock. The maximum testing depth is 300 meters. Another example of rock pressure meter also called a borehole dilatometer, is the DMP. The DMP measures directly the radial deformation using three LVDT located in the probe. The maximum capacity is 20,000 kPa. And the maximum modulus is 50 gigapascal, which allows, again, this dilatometer to be used in moderately hard rock. And finally, you can see here an example of a self-boring pressure meter. The self-boring pressure meter is an interesting tool because it minimizes the remolding of the soil. However, it is confined to soils with a few gravels. You can see on this slide the model BORMAC pressure meter, which is based on the volumetric measurement principle. It is hydraulically loaded and it is fitted with a monocellular probe. In section 1.3, I will present main applications for the pressure meter. The pressure meter data can be used for different types of structures. It can be used for shallow foundations, for laterally loaded piles, vertically loaded piles. It can be used for compaction control and for design of pavement. It is of little use for slope stability problems and embankment. Semi-empirical methods have been developed over the years in order to directly use the pressure meter parameters for specific foundations design. Most data obtained from pre-board pressure meters are used that way. It is also possible to use methods based on the theory of elasticity. This is often done when using self-boring pressure meters. When using semi-empirical methods, the bearing capacity can be calculated using the limit pressure from the pressure meter test and the k-factor consisting of, which is a function to the relative depth of the structure, to the shape of the foundation and to the type of ground. The settlement prediction can be done with this long formula. We can see that the settlement is related, among others, to E, the pressure meter modulus, and alpha P, which is function to the type of source and to the ratio E over PL. Possibly the most common application, at least in North America, is for laterally loaded structures. For instance, for bridge piles. In these cases, PY curves will be directly obtained from the pressure meter curve. Various deduction methods can be used. One of them is the Robertson method. In order to obtain a PY curve, one will use the pressure meter and radial, um, I, I'm sorry, it will he will use the pressure and the radial strain measured during a test and multiply them by the pile width. The curves display on the graph show for different type of rock the predicted lateral deflection compared to the applied load.
Another important application for pressure meter is for the foundations of high-rise buildings. Actually, an important proportion of the tallest buildings in North America have been designed from pressure meter tests. The possibility to accurately predict settlements of these large and, and complex structures with pressure meter tests possibly explains why this type of test is, oft, is often used for this application. Finally, I will conclude this presentation about pressure meters by presenting the main advantages and limitations related to this test. First, starting with the limitations. Doing pressure meter tests is of course not as simple as doing some other tests, like the SPT for instance. Well-trained well operator is required for making adequate borehole and for preventing the membrane to burst too often. This will be achieved if the operator makes sure that the borehole is not too big and has smooth uniform walls. The tests can also be stopped earlier in some cases. In soil, a bursting rate of about 1 per 8 tests is good. This rate can vary depending on the type of soil. In rock, these rates can reach 1 bursting out of 30 tests. Another limitation about the pressure meter test is the fact that some soils are more difficult to test, mainly those containing large amounts of large gravels. And now, the advantages. The pressure meter test is versatile. It can be performed in most types of soils and soft rocks. Also, it gives an in-situ stress strain curve from which many important soil parameters can be calculated. The loading sequence can be adapted according to the application, long or rapid loading, cycle loading, for instance. Also, the pressure meter is well adapted for the design of laterally loaded piles due to the close analogy between the pressure meter test and a laterally loaded pile. Finally, the validity of the test can be controlled by looking at the shape of the curve. The geotechnical engineer has the choice between numerous types of in-situ tests. For example, penetration test, vein test, plate loading test, flat dilatometer test, packer test, and the list goes on. In the second part of my presentation, I will limit myself to briefly talk about two other well-known in-situ testing equipment in which rock test has experience. First, the vein tester, and second, the cone penetrometers. The vein tester can be used in cohesive soils only. The test consists in pushing a vein into the ground to the testing depth and then to slowly apply a torque to the vein until a complete failure of the soil. The torque required to fail the soil is directly related to the undrained shear strength of the soil. This test is quick and easy and it can be used for designing either shallow or deep foundation. Some model of vein tester, as the model M1000, includes a recording head fitted with a sharp steel pointer that scribes test results on a wax paper disc. The torque is recorded radially and the angular rotation tangentially. An example of test results is shown here. The shear strength is directly obtained by multiplying the maximum torque, AS minus AF, by C, a vein constant, related to the shape and size of the vein, and by K, 
the calibration factor. Finally, the other type of testing equipment I wish to briefly describe is the cone penetrometer. This category is divided in two, the dynamic and the static cone penetrometers. The dynamic cone penetration test procedure consists in dropping repeatedly a mass on a rod fitted with a conical point and to record the number of bro counts required for thrusting this point into the ground. The size and shape of the point, the weight, the mass falling distance are standard, standardized. This type of test is not used for designing foundation. It is rather used for quick classification of the soil and for compaction control. The second category of cone penetrometers is the static cone penetrometers for doing a CPT. This test is the most common penetration test with the SPT. In that case, the conical tip is not driven but pushed into the ground at a constant rate, either manually in soft ground or using hydraulic force. During this test, the operator will record the tip resistance, friction resistance, and other parameters like the pore pressure when using an electrical cone. At least four models are available. The hand sounding cone penetrometer, the mechanical cone, the mechanical friction cone, and the electrical cones. These cones are becoming very popular. Besides the tip and friction resistance, they can monitor other parameters like pore pressure and accelerations. Static cone penetrometers are used for classification of soils using cone and friction resistance and for the determination of various parameters obtained from empirical correlations. For instance, we can get the stiffness and relative density in cohesion-less soils and the on-drained shear strength in cohesive soils. During this webinar, I essentially presented the pressure meter test and the various types of pressure meters. This was motivated by the fact that for more than 40 years, rock tests never stopped developing and marketing pressure meters, gaining a significant expertise in this type of equipment. The pressure meter test is not a routine test. It requires well-trained operators and special attention must be given to the making of the borehole. But when properly conducted, this test will yield valuable information which makes it a useful test for applications such as for laterally loaded foundations and high-rise buildings, also for situa in situation where undisturbed samples cannot be obtained and where other conventional tests cannot be done, for instance, in rock and weakly cemented material. And finally, on large projects, where it is justified to put additional efforts to get better information on the soil properties. Well, this ends this webinar about pressure meters and other in-situ testing equipment. We hope you have appreciated. Uh, thank you for joining us today and we'll now spend some time for answering questions. Thank you very much.